Thank you. Thank you again for that kind information. Uh, today, I'll be speaking on pirates and also staging of prostate cancer. It's a quite a, you know, a bit a, a lengthy topic, but we will go um, uh, pretty um, it's a concise manner. So um, let me first um, give you object to what we'll be covering in this uh, topic. So basically, I'm going to provide a brief overview of ACR PIRATS scoring system. And then followed by, we'll see some illustrations of anatomical and imaging principles related to local staging that includes EPE, SV involvement, and also tumor involving other key surgical landmarks in the pelvis. And then we're also going to discuss how this local staging and staging of prostate cancer impact management in terms of radiation or surgical. So as we all know, ACR actually you know, adopted PIRATS uh, for the past couple of years now. Um, so with the introduction of PIRATS, basically they started giving a, a structured report in, term of, in terms of uh, having a, a clinically sig significant disease in the, in the prostate gland, especially when you have focal lesion. So in order to help and have a uniform language across the radiologist and the clinicians and who refers these cases for us, uh, have a uniform reporting standards. Uh, PIRATS basically helps us to speak a, a lexicon that is uniform and uh, across the board. So when we talk about the PIRATS reporting system, we basically divide the gland into various segments and sectors. So if you look at the gland, basically we have apex, mid gland and apex, I mean apex, mid gland and base, and also we have a seminal vesicles. Again, at the, each level, we have a, a peripheral zone and transition zone that is again uh, segmented into a anterior zone, posterior zone, especially in the TZ. Whereas for peripheral zone, we have anterior horns, posterior and posterior medial segments at the base. Basically, the area around the seminal vesicles is um, central zone at the mid-level and again apex level. We'll come um, more when we see the illustrative cases. Uh, in order to maintain a uniform uh, reporting standards, PIRATS also specifies what kind of technique we should follow when we're actually imaging prostate for localized uh, disease or localized lesions. So basically, we have a small FOV sequence and also we have a large whole pelvis staging sequences. Small FOV uh, prostate specific sequences has basically helps us to identify focal lesions in the prostate gland. So that includes, you know, after obtaining a localizing um, sequences, we obtain a small field of a T2 in a three orthogonal plane, that is T2 uh, sagittals, T2 um, axials, and T2 coronals. And we also uh, obtain same field of view DWI, including um, ADC maps. And we also have a post contrast sequences with the pre and post um, uh, contrast injection. Especially for the DC sequences, we need to have some technical parameters to achieve a good temporal resolution. Um, we say at least 15 to 10 to 15 seconds, and also having to go over two minutes, little over two minutes. So this is a uh, simple uh, protocol, but again, it varies between the institutions, between the vendors. So the key things to consider here is having a small uh, field of view for prostate-specific sequences and having a small uh, slice thickness without any space between the sequences. That's a key thing to achieve, especially for anatomical sequences. So as I said, PIRATS is a Likert score, basically having from PIRATS 1 to PIRATS 5. PIRATS 1 being very low suspicion for having any clinically significant prostate cancer, versus PIRATS 5 is very high likely having a, a clinically significant prostate cancer. In order to achieve this or to get this scoring system, we basically utilize key sequences for both peripheral zone and transition zone and derive at a composite figure that basically tells us a risk stratific, I mean, uh, risk assessment. Uh, for example, uh, when you look at the T2 weighted images, uh, we use a different scoring system for peripheral, peripheral zone and transition zone. Um, many of you might have already seen this in the ACR PIRATS document. I'm going to quickly look at the um, high risk or um, high likelihood of disease. So in the peripheral zone, when you call it as a PIRATS uh, 4 for a T2 weighted sequence, it's supposed to be having a circumscribed, homogeneous, moderate, hypointense focus. It should look like a, a nodular uh, lesion and it should be less than 1.5 centimeters in greatest dimension. And if it's anything more than 5 centimeters, and having the same features, it characterized as PIRATS 5 on T2 edit sequences. Whereas in the TZ, it's a little bit different. Uh, especially if we have a BPH changes that basically tells us it's either 2 or 3, depending on how the nodules are. But if the lesion is non-circumscribed, homogeneous, and has a moder moderate high point and signal of less than 1.5 centimeter, TZ lesions, we could classify that as 4. And again, uh, typically, again, lenticular shaped lesions, that is especially along the surgical capsule, also qualify uh, to be called as PIRATS 4 on um, 
in the TZ on T2 weighted sequences. So that's a key thing to remember, especially when you're scoring on sequence based. So and again, for DWI, on DWI sequences, uh, signal abnormality is characterized on both PZ and TZ in the very similar way. So basically, when to call it as a Pyrats 4 um, on DWI sequence, it's supposed to have a focal hypo intensity on ADC and marked hyper intensity on high B value. And that basically qualifies a high risk or a high suspicion score on uh, DWI. If anything less than that, that means if you see only um, hypo intensity on ADC, uh, but do not see hyper intensity on the high V value or vice versa, uh, those will be classified as um, Pyrats 3 on DWI sequences. Again, anything linear, wedge shaped, looking like a sequelae of prostatitis, they all come under two. And again, no abnormality is usually typically normal. So once we derive these scores on T2 weighted sequences and DWI sequences, it's again to apply a kind of algorithm to basically um, get to the final score. So in the peripheral zone, our dominant sequence is DWI. Basically, we give a final score based on DWI. So if you have DWIF1, it basically is one overall pyrat score, vice versa. But if you look at, um, at pyrats three on T2 weighted sequences, DCE basically helps us in this category. Uh, if it's a, you know, DCE positive and had a Pyrats 2, Pyrats 3 um, on T2 weighted sequences, we can upgrade it to on overall score as four. And whereas for other cat, other uh, uh, sequences or other uh, lesions, any other sequence findings may not matter actually. Uh, in terms of, again, transition zone, again, focus on uh, T2, two scores, three scores, where we again have to look at, again, in the transition zone, our dominant sequence is T2-weighted sequence. And again, if you have a uh, mild suspicion or intermediate suspicion, always look at DWI. If DWI is scoring high, that's where you upgrade them to three. If it is a, if it was two, have abnormal DWI, it becomes three. If it is a abnormal, I mean, three score on T2-weighted sequences and you have abnormal DWI, you upgrade it to three. Uh, I mean, it remains three, especially in the um, T2, TZ lesion of three. So these are the key little bit of a uh, confusing scoring system that often gets in the clinical practice. So now again, I just want to show here peripheral zone, dominant sequence in DWI, and for a TZ, dominant sequence T2, Again, these are the key areas where you know other sequences matter, especially when there is an intermediate score here. Uh, this is basically, um, if you are reading it workstation, you know, keep this as at one slide at your desk desktop. It's help you to actually come to a final score just looking at you know all the information at one slide. So let's review some um, examples. So in the peripheral zone, this is just a normal gland. We don't see an abnormality, maybe some linear um, abnormalities. It's just sequelae of prostatitis. We don't see any other abnormalities in the corresponding areas in the other sequences. Again, this is a linear uh, or wedge shaped focus in the peripheral zone. And again, we do have some abnormality on the sequences, but because of its shape, it's again a benign finding. Uh, overall, Pyrats 3 here, uh, peripheral zone lesion. Uh, we have a focal abnormality that is non-circumscribed and maybe some uh, ill-defined margins and has abnormality in only one sequence. So only ADC has a little bit dark, but also on high B value and think there's not much, maybe mild enhancement. Again, overall category is Pyrats 3 here. Uh, Pyrats 4, as told clearly, is a focal lesion, has a resistive diffusion, and also enhancement. Uh, Pyrats 5, is again, size-wise, it's bigger than 1.5 centimeter. That's why it qualifies Pyrats 5. And again, the TZ lesions, uh, again, this is a normal um, central gland. Uh, central gland is basically TZ and CZ. At the mid gland level, central gland is only TZ. Um, here we see uh, diffuse uh, hyperplastic changes, maybe some heterogeneous nodule here. And again, all these changes are just to be BPH nodules. And so it's a TZ pyrats one. Again, here we can see some nodules, maybe some thickening of septae in between uh, nodules. But again, this is again called without any focal abnormality on other sequences. It is pyrats uh, two on uh, TZ sequences. Again, here it's a three. Uh, mainly, you can see uh, we see a focal abnormality in the transition zone anterior on left side. Um, corresponding area has some resistive diffusion, but not much of a high B value abnormality. Again, it's enhancement is again uh, not. Uh, significant, especially when scoring TZ lesions. So based on having only on one sequence, it's again categorized as Pyrat uh, 3 on T TZ sequence. Um, these are the atypical nodules. Uh, basically, it looks like a, a BPH nodule with circumscribed margins and having a you know, maybe partially encapsulated margin and has a high 
signal intensity and high B value and also resistor diffusion. That's why it becomes a, um, though it looks like a T2 uh, on T2 weighted sequence, it looks like a two, but because of its um, high signal abnormality features on DWI and ADC, uh, it's again upgraded to overall pyrats three. Uh, very similar case um, with, in this time, this is more of a lenticular shape along the surgical capsule with a restriction diffusion uh, that becomes four, uh, very thin, but just by size criteria. So again, to summarize, you know, pay attention to sequences when you're characterizing them depending on the zone. So DWI is our main sequence for peripheral, peripheral zone lesions and the transition zone lesions, it is T2. And again, DWI makes a much difference when assessing uh, TZ lesions and again, DC sequence plays a uh, role when you have intermediate T2 weighted um, uh, um, peripheral zone lesions. Again, there are some um, cancer mimics and pitfalls while interpreting um, focal lesions in the uh, prostate, especially using the pyrat system. So those are basically anatomically, we can have a hypertrophic uh, fibromuscular stroma that is especially anterior gland. And again, we have a thick end asymmetric thickening of surgical capsule that can also can sometimes mimic uh, Periprostatic venous plexus and fat lobules, you know, sometimes have resistive diffusion and may mimic like extra prostate extension or if the lesion that exists next to it. Uh, sometimes neurovascular bundle, uh, posterior pseudocapsular lesion, tear drop sign, those things can also help you some of the these pitfall anatomical pitfalls to um, avoid. Again, BPH, uh, depending on the amount and the extent, they also can uh, mimic some of the uh, aggressive features. Uh, inflammatory infectious pathologies such as uh, chronic prostatitis. Uh, abscess, granulomatous prostatitis can sometimes mimic as a, a prostate cancer if you are interpreting them uh, in a blind way, you know, without having to know any prior histories or any BCG uh, installations in the bladder, any of such histories will definitely help us to identify or narrow down the nutritional diagnosis. Variant histopathology uh, also is very difficult to apply PIRATS rules uh, because again, mucinous or ductal or neuroendocrine differentiation, all this um, atypical histopathology variants have a uh, different morphological features on uh, MRI and may not follow PIRATS rules. Of course, hemorrhage and calcification sometimes can also compromise uh, image quality and also um, cause pitfalls in interpreting. Uh, so again, a PIRATS has a good performance. This one meta-analysis pulling about 13 diagnostic accuracy studies. Sensitivity is over 80%. And again, specificity is over 70 with PIRATS 2.1. We are much uh, higher than this, uh, especially at the high volume centers. Moving on to the second half of the talk on staging. So when you talk about the first part was about, you know, when you see a focal lesion, when the, you are screening a prostate for a, you know, identifying a cancer, that's where you apply PIRATS. But again, if you know that there's a cancer exists in the gland based on your pathology, biology, um, biological assessment, um, then the key is to stage tumor. So there are different prognostic factors to actually um, assess prognostic significance. As we know, Gleason score is one, PSA values, and of course, T-staging is the one that mainly helps us to categorize our prognostic factors. Uh, looking at the T-staging itself, um, so we have a localized disease. I mean, T1 disease, we don't see an MRI. If it's a T2, it's basically how much it is involving the gland, very focal, tiny, T2A. Uh, I mean, half of the gland, it's T2B. If it is more than, I mean, our uh, majority of the gland, both sides, it become T2C. And again, if the tumor is gone beyond prostate, it is T3A. If the tumor is beyond prostate, involving some vesicles, it becomes T3B. Um, T4 is basically going beyond prostate, involving a bladder wall or rectal wall or geodiaphragm. From. So these are the things that becomes T4 disease. Again, there are some nuances depending on microscopic, bladder neck invasion, all those things, you know, especially pathologists, you know, if you have a, you know, um, a detailed analysis, I think that's where the pathological staging that helps actually further prognostify after post prostatectomy. Based on these factors, again, NCC and um, group actually further risk stratified and their prognostic value. Um, on that, we have basically very low to very high, depending on T-stage, depending on PSA values, depending on, again, Gleason grade uh, grouping um, on the biopsy pathology. So coming to the treatment options, depending on the what stage and what risk factors you obtain. So we have various options. We can remove the gland entirely by surgical techniques, or we can uh, give the radiation and combination of um, um, combination of uh, ADT and radiation therapy. And of course, uh, depending on, again, variant pathology and variant uh, histopathology, these may also get some chemotherapy as well. 
But the goal here is to match the treatment intensity to the level of aggressiveness. You know, if you have a glycine 6 disease and you are treating them very aggressively with surgical and radiation, then that's overkill. And again, if you have a glycine 8 disease and treating them with, you know, active surveillance or watching them or giving them a ADT is again a overkill. So we have to match, you know, intensity of the tumor uh, in the gland with the uh, appropriate treatment options. And again, the goal is to avoid over treatment and under treatment. Uh, I don't want to go details here. Radical prostatectomy basically we remove the gland. And again, there are different techniques, nerve sparing and non-nerve sparing, depending on functional outcomes um, that surgeon or patient would want to preserve after uh, management. Um, so basically, if they remove the all nerves, um, that is non-nerve sparing, that has a side effects in terms of erectile dysfunction, incontinence. Uh, if you're sparing it, again, the chances of you spreading the tumor, um, especially beyond uh, prostate, and that's the reason the nerve sparing to be performed with very caution, also very good um, surgical staging or with a pre-surgical MRI. The key thing to note here is to avoid surgical positive surgical margin, and that basically increases having to have a recurrent disease. The key areas that are actually prone to have a positive surgical margin are posterolateral base, apex, and the bladder neck. So those are the areas that we as radiologists also pay attention and inform the surgeons if you see the tumor at these locations. Of course, radiation therapy, uh, we need to be a very, very uh, clear about tumor extent, especially the tumor involves some vesicles or, you know, um, surrounding structures, surgical management is somewhat, you know, contraindicated and try to go towards radiation therapy and medical management versus surgical management. So here again, choosing various different options, um, having to have a pre-treatment MRI is also very helpful to decide on these treatment options. Um, the goal, again, is to identify, you know, when you have a staging MRI, the goal here is to identify primary lesion and also extent of the tumor. Uh, when you again identify the tumor in the gland, key is to have how well we can resect the tumor without leaving any tumor behind, and then how well we can achieve functional outcomes, that is in terms of maintaining erectile function and also uh, continence of the bladder. So because sometimes uh, patients would prefer to have these functional outcomes versus having to have aggressive treatment. So that need to be always factored in when you are counseling or providing the various treatment options to the patients. That's where pre-surgical MRI plays a very important role in terms of descending on those treatment options. Of course, especially when you have intermediate uh, NCC and risk groups um, patients, there are multiple options for them to choose depending on what kind of lifestyle they prefer to have after main treatment. And of course, uh, if you're looking for overall staging, uh, we work them with the other modalities for metastatic workup beyond pelvis, um, but especially PET CT or bone scan things would help, really help to identify disease beyond press, um, pelvis. Our goal here is to have a local staging, lymph node staging, and bone staging. As I mentioned, local staging, preferably with MRI, lymph node staging, MRI plus uh, PET, or CT. Um, sometimes um, PET is more preferred, especially with the PSMA being widely available now in the US. Uh, bone staging, preferably uh, usually done with the bone scan, but always get again uh, a PSMA scans as well to define on, uh, depending on the uh, aggressiveness of the tumor that was identified both on biopsy and also on prior images or uh, MRI. Uh, going into key local staging features that exist um, uh, now uh, for MRI to identify that maybe one is extra portion extension that we need to be clearly identifying, ex uh, define it and uh, locate it. That basically helps us help the surgeons to actually um, have a nerve sparing surgery or nerve um, sacrificing surgery. Again, similar vesicle involvement, as I mentioned, it is a key factor to decide on surgical versus uh, radiation management. And other key side um, surgical landmarks are the pelvic floor involvement or rectal involvement or pelvic sidewall involvement. Um, uh, so let's see each one of them. So EPE is basically the tumor extends beyond the surgical capsule. I mean, so beyond the pseudo capsule. There's no true capsule on the prostate. So basically, it's basically a pseudo capsule. If it goes beyond the pseudo capsule, we usually call them as extra prostate extension. If it's extra prostate extension at the level of base, it usually involves in the vesicle. If it is involving the um, periprostatic fat or neurovessel bundle, that's where we call them as involvement of neurovessel bundle. Here we can see neurovessel bundle as a small, tiny dots uh, with a T2 dot signal. Um, EPE is a spectrum of finding. It's not a yes or no or in a presenter absence. It's, a, it's actually a spectrum. You know, invariably it begins with a microscopic extension beyond the prostate. And then you can start seeing them on MRI as a you know various direct and indirect signs. And then obviously when it's really beyond prostate, that where actually DRE examination can actually identify it. So that's a spectrum uh, depending on where the findings exist. Uh, we should be able to identify it either by uh, MRI or by DRE examination. Here is one case where very subtle 
several uh, imaging findings in one case. If you look at the MRI, they look very similar. There's a tumor on the left side peripheral zone and maybe have a capsular abutment. But obviously, we don't see anything beyond, but one had a positive model. I mean, um, this case, there's no EPE on histopathology, and this case had a histopathology uh, positive uh, EPE. So that basically tells us, especially when there is no proper uh, disease outside prostate gland, you need to be very, very cautious in terms of calling it as EPE, and preferable to have a Likert score again to give your likelihood of suspicion. Uh, in this case, we can see the uh, peripheral zone uh, ending here, but there is a tumor going beyond peripheral zone. That's where the clear, obvious, you know, typical APE that exists beyond prostate gland. This is a spectrum I sold. Um, so direct sign is when tumor is extended beyond prostate margin and involves periprostatic peri tissue. Uh, whereas other signs are all indirect signs. So depending on what you see, uh, your Likert scoring system you know, will affect. So just a bulge or just capsular abutment, that's very early sign of you know, having to have a microscopic extracloster extension versus capsular bulge, having a contour irregularity depending on the amount of tumor. And obviously, this tumor is beyond the prostate margin. So those are the indirect signs and direct signs. There are different different scoring systems. Usually the one first introduced was a uh, European Society Urological Radiology scoring system, almost like a more than a decade now. Um, but combining some of these factors, uh, NCI actually proposed another grading system based on multiple factors, uh, just having to bulge or multiple bulge and irregularity and uh, obviously uh, over disease outside prostate. So especially when you have these findings, you are having a risk of EPE is about 66% and their cohort, again, it goes less and less as they have only one finding versus multiple findings. And again, some of the key locations, as I mentioned, those are high risk for surgical mar surgical positive margin. Uh, pay attention, when really, especially when you see the tumor, these locations, they are prone to have a uh, extra prostate extension and positive surgical margin. The one is um, you have a posterior lateral aspect of the, the apex, and you also anteriorly, and also this is something called invaginated extra prostate space around the ascendal vesicles, or um, uh, ejaculatory ducts, sorry. So these are the key areas to be paying attention, um, especially when you see the tumor at these locations. Uh, clinical imp implications, as I mentioned, if it is a gone beyond prostate, we don't uh, do a nerve sparing at that site. And if it's again involving some vesicle, it impacts decision on radiation management. Uh, a few words about positive surgical margin. It's again a tumor that exists on inked margins. You know, usually if you've seen the grossing of pathology, um, prostate specimens, they basically they ink them on both sides to identify the site. And if anything is beyond ink margin or touching the ink margin, that's where you call them as a in positive surgical margin. Depending on how well the surgeon resected periprostatic fat, you can actually identify them going beyond prostate margin, but invariably, usually we see them as an ink margin positive. But again, risk factors, as I said, um, for having a positive surgical margin is again tumor location, its relationship with the you know, prostate, uh, and again, volume of the prostate volume, depth of the tumor, depth of the gland in the pelvis, because sometimes if the, if the pelvis deep and the prostate is deep in the pelvis, it's sometimes it's difficult to dissect. And also uh, with uh, dif technical difficulties of resecting it, we may leave or won't, we may some tumor in the pelvis itself. So all these factors combined with the surgeon's experience, volume of the tumor, pathological stage, Gleason grade, you know, PSA levels, and all these are the other factors that were modeled into the risk stratification. Um, next one is amyloid vesicle involvement. As you see, the tumor uh, involving amyloid vesicles here. Uh, MRI has a good sensitivity specificity in terms of over 60% uh, for sensitivity and over 95% for uh, specificity. Again, T2-weighted sequences uh, corresponding DDWI and enhancement pattern is it helps us to identify uh, uh, SV involvement. So key is to again identify uh, SV involvement by looking at multi sequences, multiple sequences and planes. So for example, uh, a few cases I'm going to show future will show you as uh, sagittal images, and these are coronal images. This is one example just show various patterns of SV involvement. So one is direct spread. If a tumor is at the base level, it can directly spread into the adjacent periprostatic fat and again involves the seminal vesicle. Um, in this case, tumor is through the capsule and again involving going beyond and involving the seminal vesicles. This is asynchronous. It means you know the tumor is in the seminal vesicles. This is an axial images, DWY. Tumor is in the um, uh, similar vesicles bilaterally, uh, DWI and DC sequences, but whereas there's nothing exists at the level of base. So tumor, the bulk tumor was at the apex, but the tumor deposits were in the uh, similar vesicles. So these are the atypical, and again, uh, discontinuous tumor involvement of similar vesicles. These are the common patterns, but this is the most common one. This is the second most, and this is one of the latest one. Um, again, um, 
some of the challenges here. You can see the tumor at the level. This is a coronal image. You can see the tumor at the level of base, at the upper stage of the ducts and similar vesicles. Uh, this is sagittal images, the same tumor, maybe surrounded by SV. And if you look at the, this, again, very similar findings you can see here as well. But when you look at the histopathology here, one was positive. Uh, this was actually having a seminal vesicle involvement on pathology. This was did not have. So basically, that basically tells us just averting the seminal vesicle on sagittal and coronal MRI is not a direct sign of um, seminal vesicle involvement. So in all, again, in pathology, to call it a seminal vesicle involvement, they're supposed to have a muscularis propria involvement. So all these things are nuances that you know you get to see as you see the advanced cases and seeing the, you know more cases of seminal vesicle involvement and again analyze them on multiple planes. Impact, uh, depending on the extent of involvement, um, EPE and SV, uh, they may not qualify to get a, uh, especially brachy and uh, uh, EBRT. There are other additional uh, landmarks um, that we need to be paying attention, that is extra urethral sphincter at the apex level, bladder neck at the base level, uh, neurovascular bundle posterior laterally and bilaterally, anterior muscular stroma, anteriorly, that's again uh, one of the common pitfall as well to interpret. The rectum posteriorly and geodiaphragm um, inferiorly at, around the uh, apex. So quick uh, going over some of the findings here. Um, this is external urethral sphincter that basically at the level of apex, this is a coronal image. You can see a normal striated muscles that in the you know long parallel manner. And you can also see a donut shaped or um, if the South Indians are around, it's not a shaped uh, structure here uh, in the apex that basically compromised normal uh, external urethral sphincter. Uh, this is key surgical and uh, radiation oncology related landmark because having to spare this anatomical part will improve much um, outcomes in terms of uh, urinary symptoms. So if the surgeons can spare a good amount of apex and have a good anastomosis, they can actually maintain a good functional outcome after surgery. And if the radiation oncologist can avoid this area of implanting radiation seeds or radiation therapy seeds, they can actually avoid burning maturation and things of a, uh, that nature and the post-radiation uh, uh, life. So that's the reason this is one of the key relevant uh, anatomical sequence that people need to be identifying and helping the surgeons and radons to avoid any over-treatment or under-treatment of it. In bladder neck, uh, this is again critical structure, difficult to identify sometimes on sequence, on imaging, uh, I mean, involvement of bladder neck, I mean. So on uh, anatomical images, definitely you can see it, uh, but because of lack of any uh, tissue planes between the prostate and the bladder, it is very difficult to identify bladder neck involvement prospectively, when, especially when it is subtle. The tumor, as you can see here, this is normal bladder wall, T2 dark signal, and glands also extends into the bladder neck. But if the tumor signal exists in the bladder, I mean, at the base, and if you have a discontinuity of the bladder, wall, that's one of the signs of having the bladder neck involvement. Again, this is very difficult and prospectively to identify, too, especially when you have a abnormal signal in all sequence and the tumor is at the level of base and extending into the bladder neck. Again, it's something to call and again, helps surgeons to avoid positive surgical margin. As I said, neurovascular bundle that exists posterior laterally on both sides. Uh, again, there's a lot of anatomical variants. Uh, there are, again, theories on how these bundles form. Uh, some theory is that, you know, basically a focal uh, anatomical structure that exists along the postulateral aspect, superiorly and inferiorly. Some say it's a diffuse from the base to apex. Uh, some say that exists across the prostate, you know, but again, depending on the what pattern you see on, um, on the particular patient, usually it's along the postulateral aspect of the tumor that exists next to it can actually compromise um, and extend into it. That just because uh, these structures basically pierce the capsule, that is pseudo capsule, and have an easy um, way to the tumor cells to spread along these tracks. Uh, anterior muscle, fibromuscular stroma, as I said, this is again thick um, T2 hypointense signal and the anteriorly, uh, this is again pitfall uh, if you again see standalone finding, but often uh, correlate with adjacent structures and see if any tumor signal exists and that exists beyond that. And if you have any asymmetric thickening, always call it as a tumor. Otherwise, typically, if you have a symmetric finding and it's especially at the base, it's usually a pitfall. Surgical versus non-surgical management, I briefly told earlier, but again, when you have a structures like rectal wall, geodiaphragm involvement, those are definitely you know, cases for non-surgical management. In this case, at the apex level, you're seeing the bulky tumor here. The tumor is involved in rectal wall. Uh, as you can see, muscular property has been pulled here and actually measures the rectal coil here. You can see the tethering of the rectal wall to the apex and the tumor is here. 
So this again, direct sign of rectal wall involvement, especially when you do not see a, such a direct signs here, it's very difficult to prospectively call. In those scenarios, always look at sagittal sequences, both on T2 and T1 weighted sequences, especially on T1, fat may appear as sometimes bright and have a clear line between um, wall and the posterior prostate margin that helps you sometimes to identify um, a clear plane and fat plane. Uh, this is again old case where there is a bulky tumor in the prostate. Again, goes beyond prostate involving the rectal wall tumor also in the rectal lumen. Uh, you can see on all sequences on post contrast, we can see heterogeneous necrotic areas as well. Uh, another lesion where tumor is directly involved in the GU diaphragm inferiorly, as you can see, apex and prostate apex is compromised. Tumor is gone beyond. Here you can see normal levator muscle on the right side, but on the left side, you can see the compromised signal, and the tumor is in the uh, muscularis uh, layer, I mean, in the muscles. Here, tumor gone beyond and went in ahead um, and spread into the bladder wall. This is a direct bladder wall involvement. This word cases, you can easily identify them. Um, so in this case, tumor is basically traveled along the posterior lateral aspect of the gland and again involve the bladder wall. So to summarize, basically, we have a key anatomical key areas that is um, extra prostate extension, Neurovascular involvement, some vascular involvement, rectal wall, external mitral sphincter, GU diaphragm, bladder neck, and the bladder wall. These are the key areas to be uh, in mind when you're interpreting uh, a staging MRI for prostate cancer. Yeah, and again, lymph node, as I said, we can definitely identify local regional lymph nodes, especially in the pelvis. Uh, but whereas beyond pelvis, we need additional images, either CT or PET, depending on the risk stratification. So uh, here, the most common findings we see are in the obturator and external iliac chain. And again, it can go in any chains in the pelvis and again go into retroperitoneum and common iliac and the retroperitoneal parietic nodes. Uh, again, um, as I think uh, we heard uh, Dr. Morani mentioning, it again depends on. Um, depending on your aggressive tumor in the prostate. If you don't see anything or if you see a very low-grade tumor or a very small amount of uh, tumor in the prostate, it's again very unlikely to have any node in the pelvis to be called as a prospectively abnormal node. Again, there are other differential diagnoses including lymphoma, leukemia, and other um, reactive nodes can also sometimes appear bulky and need to be always in the differential diagnosis when you have a, a low pre-test um, probability of having a bulky tumor in the prostate. Again, bone metastasis, we can only see in the pelvis and we have a two sequences for staging, especially whole pelvis T2, T1. And we, in our practice, we obtained T1 sequence, but some practices in my fellowship, we used T2. So depending on what you obtain, be familiar with the bone findings. And often these findings are difficult, especially when you have a limited sequences to evaluate a bone metastasis. Often these findings are evaluated with the bone scan or with PET scan and again, again, ended up having the biopsy as well, especially um, having a bone disease is a, again, a significant risk stratifying factor for management. So it excludes all your local treatments. So that's the reason they often get them, you know, undergo biopsy before giving them a definitive local therapy. So again, to summarize second part of my talk, basically on staging. So local, local regional staging of prostate, you know, basically uh, influences in CN risk stratification and which directly informs prognosis and management. That's the main reason when you are having a talk with the patient about management decisions, this plays a very important role. And again, EPE um, is not a yes or no question. It's a multifactorial likelihood scale. Should always give you know, all the factors in consideration, give them always a like at school, unless you have a gross EPE. Again, always look for key anatomical landmarks around the prostate when you have a bulky disease to identify key structures and their involvement. Okay.